Welcome on the next lecture of the BIM Technology at Poznan University of Technology. On today's lecture, we will talk about slightly different topic than we were presenting the week before. Good afternoon. So on today's topic, we will talk, of course, about the BIM and the BIM content in particular. However, we will focus very much on the information the information which is inside the BIM content. And when it comes to information, we will divide this lecture on, let's say, two main parts. One of the parts will be conducted by me, so I will put a bit more light on the concept of omnichannel, and I will also uh, tell about the, the PIM. It sounds very similar to BIM, but this is something slightly different, although very much connected with the BIM itself. In the latter part, one of my colleague, Francois Gears, will tell a bit more uh, about the ETIM and ETIM MC standard, of course, in the context of BIM. And when it comes to, let's say, our today's speaker, so you probably are familiar with me if you were participating in one of the previous webinars, but you probably are not familiar with Francois Gears. He's a good friend of mine who is dealing with the data management for the past several years. Uh, I met him when he was working for Zender. Right now, he's an independent consultant, which is helping other companies to manage their BIM data, uh, their, their product information data. And in addition to that, he is also very much familiar within the E-Team standard, which he is about to tell you about it on today's lecture. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome Francois Gears. Hello, Francois. Hi, Bastian. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining. OK, so I think that we can start with, with our today's lecture. So we will, in the first part, focus on the BIM in the context of the BIM uh, omnichannel and uh, and the promotion of the manufacturer products through the BIM content. And in the latter part, Francois will proceed with, with the ETIM and the ETIM MC standard. So let's let's move on. I, I think that as on the previous lecture, I presenting some sort of a quote for the lecture. So here's another quote for today's lecture. The content is the reason search began in the first place. It was said by Leo then one of the, let's say, experts within the marketing, who is running the marketing agency within the US. And I think that this quote is very accurate, not only in terms of the marketing content, but also in terms of the BIM content, which in the long run is still also a marketing content, content especially in the context of, of manufacturers. So let's try to figure out first what the BIM content really is. Of course, we spoke on the one of the first lectures that the BIM content is actually an information, a metadata, and the geometry. But what exactly we can have within the information? Because this was pretty much vague and it wasn't explained, let's say, in much details on the previous lectures. So what kind of information we can actually have within the BIM content? Well, we can have the product sheets and quality certificates, technical approvals, and so on. These data might differ across different regions, across different countries, across different jurisdictional reg legal regulations. What else? In addition to that, this is the geometry which we were talking about. So if you were on the previous lecture, you probably are more familiar with the, the let's say, the, our findings that geometry is just a subset of the product information which is within the BIM content. And the parametrization is just a subset of the geometrical data. What else? Of course, the product information, which are the most substantial one, especially in the context of of manufacturer, I think also in the to in the context of product particular features, I think that when it comes to the feature and the standardization of of uh, naming the the features, the attributes of particular product will be covered more in details 
in the second part of the lecture when Francois will put a bit more light on the E-team standard. And last but not least, the marketing information. So we would like to, let's say, present not only the technical data, which might be relevant, but most, maybe also some marketing data, like some, some nice 3D visualization, some nice rendering of the data, and maybe also some videos, instruction of, uh, of the product to somehow convince the ones that are actually using our content to place them within their projects within their pro uh, within their let's say um, within their work okay so these are the data which can be stored within the bim content and of course from the manufacturer perspective they wanted to store this data inside to promote the content but there are several ways in doing the content promotions and i think two most obvious one well actually the one most obvious one is of course bim portals so i'm sure that some of you uh, from the previous lectures already are familiar what the bim portals are maybe i will do a quick poll do you know what the bim portals are yes or no starting the poll and waiting for your answers uh, for for the next let's say 15 seconds so the BIM portals are actually the some sort of a marketplaces, some sort of, I would say, an equivalent to typical, let's say, known from a daily basis marketplaces like Amazon, eBay, and if you're familiar with Polish marketplaces, then probably are more familiar with Allegro. And this is something similar, but they are not selling the product. They are actually promoting the BIM content. And uh, there are several different market, BIM portals available on the market. I will talk about it in, in, uh, in the next slides. I will also tell you how the BIM portals are actually being used to do the promotion of the BIM content. However, in addition to BIM portals, there are also some other options which you can promote the content. And all of these options can be somehow boxed within a, within the the common name of omni channels so the omni channel will also be covered on today's lecture i will tell you what does it mean and how we can apply it to beam content and what are the origins of omni channel because believe it or not it doesn't come from the beam nor from the construction industry at all okay i think that we can in general finish the poll and publish the results so great majority of you knows what the beam portal is so it's, it's it's really good so maybe another poll that we will do right now do you know what the omni channel is so uh, another poll that uh, that we're opening and i think that we can move on to the next slide i will wait a bit with your answers but let's navigate back to to the bim portals and the way how the manufacturer can actually use the bim portals to start to start the promotion of their BIM content. So the, the job related to BIM portals and the, the activities related with promotion through the BIM portals are, are relatively simple in principle. So first of all, manufacturer needs to find someone who, is who will prepare the BIM content on his, on his behalf. There are two main approaches to do these activities. Either manufacturer has its own team of specialists internally, which prepares the BIM content. Some of the organization, like for instance, Hilti does that. The, on the other hand, there are some organization that prefers to outsource the preparation of the BIM content to some dedicated external service providers. So if manufacturer would like to promote through the BIM portals, for sure they need to find someone that creates the BIM content for them. Once they find the service provider internally or externally, Finally, they are creating the BIM libraries of their product portfolio. Once the BIM libraries are being prepared, they are placing these libraries into this BIM portal, which, uh, which they are, let's say, interested in. There can be more than one BIM portal that the manufacturer can be interested in. I will tell about it a bit later as well. But in general, once the content, once the BIM libraries are placed within the, within the BIM portals, they can be downloaded by the designers they can be downloaded by the planners the idea is that the bim portals usually aggregates a user range of specific 
target group. So they, it's not some, let's say, uh, typical user range as, as we can find on Amazon or eBay. This is a very targeted user range of architects, of designers, of planners, of uh, map consultants, and so on. So from the perspective of the manufacturer, it's pretty much targeted and it increased the probability of placing their product within the projects, which is good. But of course, everything has its pros and cons. So let's talk about the pros and cons of this approach. So what are the pros of using the BIM portals from the perspective of, of the content owner of the BIM library owners, so manufacturers, but not only. Some of the BIM portals are also allowed to to publish some custom content which doesn't belong to any manufacturers and some of, let's say, large design studios that have their own BIM libraries that they are planning to use within their BIM project also can use that kind of approach to have their BIM libraries orchestrated in some way. But what are the pros of using the BIM portals? So first of all, this is a relatively simple solution because the the bim portals already exist it's like placing some some advertisement on, on an ebay it's you can just do that within the blink of an eye maybe it's not possible to do that as quick with the bim content however it's still relatively quick the other advantage is that the bim portals have usually a user range so they have the active user that registered once on the bim portals and from time to time they're getting back to their site to download the content so so from the marketing perspective this is actually the marketing range that wants to be used by the content owners by the manufacturers so another advantage is definitely i think the one of the greatest one is definitely the user range of the particular portals the third one is the necessity or the lack of necessity of having your own infrastructure so if you're a manufacturer and you would like to have the bim content stored and distributed somewhere to to the planners to the designers to the to the to the to the consultants somehow you would need to have some some sort of a server where you can upload this content from where these users are able to fetch that so from this perspective if you don't if you need to have your own server probably you need a person that will look after that well in case of bim portals it is not let's say required because they are doing that on their own leaving you the let's say leaving you without the necessity of supervising the server infrastructure so for sure quite convenient solutions and last but not least i think that the the one of the main let's say business model of the BIM portals is actually the preparation of the content. So the BIM portals very often offers the service of preparing the BIM libraries, which later on are stored on their own site. So from the manufacturer perspective, it could be convenient, but there is a price. So what are the cons? Okay, first con is that you're on the marketplace. You're not on your own individual site, which is tailored for your product portfolio. You're together with others where the others might either be your competition or may offer completely different set of product portfolio. So if you're selling the windows, you will be presented alongside with other windows manufacturer, but also with the manufacturer of the pumps or the piping and fittings. So as a result, if the manufacturer would like to promote itself quite extensively, this might not be uh, the best, let's say, option or, or maybe not the only one that he should think of. The other thing is the, 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 the thing that uh, the portals not necessarily are adapted to specific regions. So the thing is that if you navigate to some particular BIM portals, you're not sure if the content which is actually provided by particular manufacturer is actually available in your specific location. Take Poland, for instance. If I would navigate to one of the, let's say, international BIM portals, 
and I would like to see product portfolio report of particular manufacturers, first of all, it is very unlikely that the product information which is inside the BIM files are tailored for the Polish region. Probably they, are, they would be only available in English. Probably they will not cover any technical approval of the Polish market. And it could be the case also that the product portfolio of this particular manufacturer is not even being sold in Poland. So, so it could be quite it could be quite misleading. The other thing that I think that is worth mention is that, as I mentioned at the very beginning, while you're on the BIM portal, you're not alone as a manufacturer, you're alongside with the other manufacturers. So, so if you would like to have something very specific for your product portfolio, for instance, the configurator of the lift shafts, it's pr pretty unlikely to do that within the BIM portal because BIM portal needs to be as generic as possible so that each and every product which is available on the on the this portal can actually fit in so if i would like to have some custom filtering if i would like to have some custom configurator options it is pretty much unlikely to do that with the bim portal the other challenge or the cons is that depending on the region different portals are more or less attractive or more or less popular from the perspective of the user. So in Poland, we have a different port, one portal which is a market leader. It's a local Polish BIM content portal. But in the UK, there is a completely different one. In the Scandinavia, there is completely different one. In the Benelux, there is completely different one. I don't want to name to, to tell you what are the names of the portals, but believe it or not, it depends, the popularity really depends on the region. So if the manufacturer thinks about promoting their BIM portfolio through the BIM portals, and they are also planning to address several different BIM markets, it could be the, the case that it would be necessary to use more than one portal. And when it comes to the data which are actually uploaded into the BIM portal, you also need to remember one important aspects. Once the data are being uploaded into the BIM portal, the ownership stays on the BIM portal site, not on your site. Another disadvantage is the question, I would say that, I wouldn't call it a disadvantage, I would maybe just challenge a bit the thesis that the BIM portals actually promotes the manufacturers, because I'm not 100% sure if they promote manufacturers or they promote them, the BIM portal itself more. Because like I said, there are several different manufacturers. The manufacturer may, may have their product portfolio next to the other competitors. And like I said, the question stays whether the BIM portal actually promotes more the, BIM manuf the, 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 the construction manufacturer or the BIM portal itself. I will leave this question without the answer but I think that you know what I have in mind. And last but not least, I think that this is also one of the greatest disadvantage of BIM portals is that, as I mentioned at the very beginning, BIM portals offers you the service of preparing the BIM content. However, it could be the case that you don't want to use their service. You would like to prepare the BIM content on your own or using some of your trusted service providers. If that is the case, the BIM portals might have some objection with that and force you to pass some quite unpleasant verification process in order to make sure that this particular that this particular uh, content is suitable for your case. So there are some pros and there are some cons of using the BIM portal. But let's publish our pool because right now we're entering the omni channel and as you can see great majority of uh, of the audience uh, so over 60 percent has has no a clue what the omni channel really is but on the other hand there there are someone there, there are some people on the audience which i'm pretty happy that uh, they are familiar with the omni channel what the omni channel is okay I see that we have also some questions on the audience from Onat. 
could you tell us what is the biggest difference between those BIM portals? I mean, in different countries. Okay, so to be honest, it depends. So some BIM portals offer some more sophisticated features. Some of them just offer placing the content on their site. Some of them support regionalization. Some of them don't. Some of them are more popular, let's say, in UK but no one knows about them in, in Poland and vice versa. And uh, some of them actually offers possibility of automated update of product information and some of them don't. So it always depends on the features. It always depends on the popularity. From the end user perspective, I think that the most important fact is that the BIM portal should provide the content which is available on the destination market that the, the specific planner or or the designer is on so that he he knows that the product portfolio which is downloaded from the BIM portal is accurate for his or her specific market and that the data inside this BIM content is up to date and how this is achieved on the BIM portal site if it's even achieved because it's not always the case then this is a completely different topic can we use other countries? Okay, another question. Can we use other countries' content and modify it according to our desires? Of course that you can. If you have a time, most of the designers don't want to, to do that. They just wanted to download the content which is up to date and which is accurate to their specific region. But of course, once you download the content, you can do whatever you like with it. Okay, so let's let's move on. Let's move on to the other option. So the option which actually refers to the omni-channel. So what the omni-channel really is, I think that you remember this slide from our previous lecture when I was telling you that the manufacturer are trying to address several target audience. So they are, of course, addressing planners. They are, of course, addressing the designers, but not only. In addition to that, they might also be interested in addressing installers. They might be interested in addressing general contractors or the investors. So there are several different users or type of users that the manufacturer might be interested in approaching. And all of these users may use different communication channels. Some of them might open the manufacturer site. Some of them might be using the, the BIM plugins like the, the plugin for Revit probably that would be the BIM designers, but some of them might not be very technical and may just use, for instance, virtual reality or augmented reality solutions, because maybe, for instance, investor has no technical background, but still would like to see how the particular product looks like. So from the manufacturer perspective, if they, uh, they would like to address different types of user, they most likely need to approach them through different marketing channels so when it comes to that great majority of the manufacturer already do that the issue is that these channels are not interconnected with each other and it could be the case that the information in one channel is not the accurate or the same as in the other channel and in in a result it can cause some serious mistake especially if the data which are not up to date are being used in the design which later on were used in the construction of the particular object. So the goal of communicating with the different user through different channels in a, let's say, orchestrated way so that we are sure that all the data are always up to date, all the data are always tailored to particular, let's say, type of user, to particular region, to particular type of communication channel to to particular even language this is actually the omni channel the omni channel is actually the strategy where we control the product information from the central location and we distribute it along down to a different communication channel but not only this information is also contextual what does that mean it means that when you're distributing the set of information, it is actually adapted to particular channels. So if I'm a designer in Poland, then most likely I would be interested in a slightly different set of information 
than if I would be an installer in Germany or facility manager in the UK. All of them might be interested in some product information, but most some of them might even be the same, but some of them may differ and might be even available in a different language or using a different technical approval or quality certificate specific for a particular region. So how we can apply omnichannel? We can apply it through the solution which is called PIM. So the PIM is actually a central location of the product information, which later on can be distributed to a different endpoint. And one of these endpoints is actually the BIM content. And as I said at the beginning, this information can be contextual. So I can specify which, inf set, on, which set of information should be provided for, let's say, for the BIM content in Poland, and which set of information should be provided for the BIM content in the UK or, or, or in Germany. Moreover, I can also specify which product portfolio is available where. So if I know that, for instance, I'm, a, I'm an HVAC manufacturer and I don't want it to sell, let's say, heat pumps to, to Spain because no one will buy them, but these heat pumps are quite, let's say, desirable in the Nordic countries, then I can prepare that kind of, let's say, configuration within the PIM system. And this information will be also reflected within the PIM content. The same manufacturer may decide that, for instance, instead of selling the heat pumps in the in the Spain, they more, maybe would prefer to, to sell the PV panels, the solar panels in Spain, but they don't want to sell the solar panels in Scandinavia because maybe there is not enough sun to promote it and to sell it to, to make it profitable. And thanks to that, they are able to control to, to not only to control the data from the central location, but they can also make this data contextual. And the same refers to the technical approvals, the same refers to, to the language itself. So the 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 main advantage of the omnichannel strategy is to first of all you control the data from the central location. The second of all, the data are always up to date. This is quite substantial because if you have the channels, the communication channels not in sync, then you can end up in the situation where you have a different set of information across different channels. I'm not sure, I think that I, I told this example on one of the previous lecture when one of my friends, she's an ar architect, she was using the content of one of the manufacturers of the fire protection gate which data were not up to date and in the end uh, they were using the data the outdated data within their project and it ended up in forging over 200 concrete walls so oh, the data update is pretty much critical especially in the construction sector the other the other thing is this contextualization i was telling you about so it's important to adapt the set of information depending on who you're talking to and where you're talking to. So the, the, the designer in, in, in Poland and the facility manager, facility manager in the UK are completely different responsibilities which might be interested in a completely different set of information, not mentioning the language, of course. Of course, if you're using the omnichannel strategy, you can work with BIM portals, you can work with your own site, you can work with wholesaler site, you, you can work with different and different other channels like BIM plugins or 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 even some some external service providers. And all of these channels, all of these external pro or internal providers might have their user range. So if you use them all, it gives you a bigger probability that you can reach the target audience. Sometimes you can, like I mentioned before, you, you would be interested in promoting your content through your own site, but maybe also through the BIM portals. And due to the fact that different BIM portals have, have a different, let's say, popularity across different areas, across different regions, it could be the case that you might be interested in using more than one, but in the end, you control that centrally. So there is no case that you have the data out of sync. Of course, the collecting the data for the market analysis is quite substantial for the marketing, uh, and especially for the omnichannel marketing. So you need to know what kind of communication channel converts best 
and where you should put more, let's say, focus on and which marketing channels you should, let's say, skip aside. What else? The data ownership. If you're controlling the data, if the data resides on your side and not on some external parties, you are the owner of the data. Yeah, and uh, and I think that this is also quite substantial to to have this this ownership. If you have this on your side, you can customize the solution. So it's the it's it's important, especially if your product portfolio is pretty much sophisticated and requires some more more specific solution than the one offered by the generic BIM portals, like for instance configurators. Or, or different kind of selection assistance, which might be very specific for a particular product portfolio. And last but not least, from the perspective of the BIM content owner, it is important to promote their brands and not the BIM portal brands. So I think that from the perspective of the manufacturers, I'm not saying that they, they shouldn't use the BIM portals, quite contrary, the BIM portals are actually providing the user range, but they should definitely focus on promoting their brand and their channels and making the ownership of their marketing data they are collect on their site rather than on some external ones. So I will show you a slight demo of how the omnichannel could look like. So uh, I told you that the heart of the omnichannel is the PIM, the PIM which can be considered as the product information database. Within the PIM you can specify which product portfolio should go on which region, in which language, in what attributes, technical approvals, quality certificates should be provided. I won't cover different standardization of the attributes convention. This will be covered by my colleague Francois when, it, when he will describe a bit more, uh, when he will talk a bit more about ETIM. But I will, from the technical perspective, show you how the process of transferring the data from the PIM system into the into the BIM content looks like. So if you were on the previous lectures, you probably are familiar with the BIM Streamer platform. So there is a BIM Streamer platform module called back office where let's say the whole magic starts. So this back office was connected to some PIM, to some PIM vendor. In this case, I use the Akinio. Of course, we can connect to other PIM vendors, but I use the Akinio as, as an example. Within the Akinio, we specify product information. And in addition to the product information from the Akinio, we've also provided some example 3D BIM content. Within the BIM streamer back office, we combine these data together, creating different language specific, region specific BIM files. And later on, we've managed to publish it somewhere. We, during the demo, we skip the publication part because we have a limited amount of time, but we will show you how we specify the data within the PIM, how we transfer this data from the PIM into the BIM streamer, how we convert, how we, uh, how we inject this data inside the BIM streamer and generate the BIM content. In order to do that, I will start sharing my screen and we can move on to, to the demo. Okay, so let's move on. I will open full screen for, for the better presentation. So right now we've logged into the PIM, to the Akinio PIM. As we see, there is some dashboard with some, with some statistics, with some tasks that needs to be done. We specify four channels. One of the channels is BIM Streamer, which provides the content for Germany and for England in two languages. In addition to that, there, there was also a connector that was uh, connected to the BIM streamer so that the PIM knows where the data should be sent over. In addition to that, you see that the, the Akinio PIM also provides functionality of, of digital assets. So like, we, like images, like videos, this is marketing information, which can also be in, installed inside the BIM content, as I mentioned at the very beginning. Here we have two windows in two variants, WinBC and WinBC2, which we will present, which we will present on the, within the BIM content as well. I just wanted to show you that we've changed here the, the language of the content, the language of the product, and we see 
that the completeness of the product is 20, 92. It means that before, before that we had the language specified to English and we saw that the completeness was set to 100, but we see that for the German language, some attributes are actually missing. So let's fill them in. So we're opening one of the product variant. In this case, this is the, the WinBC uh, WinBC uh, 2. We see that for for the English for the Beamstreamer German channel, something is missing. We see that the Kurzbeschreibung, which is short description, is, is the missing attribute. So let's fill it in. And as a result, we would be able to complete the necessarily attributes. So I will freeze for a second. So as you can see, most of the, let's say, most of the PIM solutions not only gives us the possibility to adapt product information to particular region, making it contextual, provide some digital asset management solutions so that we can place additional marketing data within the BIM content like PDFs, videos, and so on. But it also provides the functionality of verifying completeness of the product information, not only from the perspective of the general product, but also from the perspective of specific contexts, like, for instance, context of English or German translations for particular region. And once we have everything pretty much ready, we can distribute this information to BIM streamer. So we are connecting the PIM system to a BIM streamer. And right now we send this information to BIM streamer, right? And after that, we switch to the BIM streamer. We've already collected the information from the PIM. And let's synchronize this, this uh, set of product, this set of product uh, content. In this case, we're focusing on the Germany. And as you can see, the BIM streamer platform needs to execute 44 different tasks with, in order to complete the generation of the content. One of these tasks is, of course, the injection of the attributes in English. The other one would be the injection of the attributes in in, Pol in, in German, sorry, but not only. It also performs something like a conversion to a different file formats, like P PNGs, like DWGs, IF, uh, IFC, Obeyot, and, and so on. So there are quite a, quite a lot of things that are actually happening. And please remember that we're doing that for two product variants for window and for window two, as we name it within the Aquino. And uh, as you can see right now, the synchronization has ended and we can check the result. So as we, uh, in the result, you have two windows. One window has the height uh, 2,500. You can also see the data. Within the data, as I mentioned before, we can also include some media assets like, like PDFs, videos, and so on. And uh, of course, we have here a geometry. The same geometry can be displayed on the drawings. As you can see, the, maybe I will backward it a bit. So as you can see, we've managed also to generate the drawings, which contains the measurements, the dimensions, which, taken, which are taken from the PIM. And I can steer this geometry directly from the PIM and also reflect this geometry within the BIM content, if, of course, the BIM content was prepared in a proper way. So once we have it ready, oh, here is also the video, which we can also include within the BIM, within the BIM content as another media, media asset. What else we can do? We can, for instance, download it and open that within the Revit. And once, once we open it, we see that the very same attributes are available within the Revit properties. These are the attributes which comes directly from the PIM. And moreover, they are contextual. So they were adapted to specific set of regional or language requirement. Here we switch the data to German. And as you can see after the download of the RFA file, we will open the Revit, we will open the properties, and within the properties, you will see that there are some 
German attributes as well. So this is actually the possibility of steering the product information from the central location and adapting it to, to a different channels, to a different regions, to a different users. Moreover, as you can see right now, we have different windows specified, which has the, the height of 3000. As you can see the same window here, it has the weight, uh, height 3000, and it was also reflected with the geometry. So it's not only the case that we can steer the data inside the content, we can also steer the geometry. And I think that this is the, the most relevant one. Within the process of synchronization, we actually use the single object, but we generated two independent variants. And based on these variants, each of them have a different geometry. So let's open both of these variants within the Revit so that we can compare them one by one. So uh, in, in order to upload the window into the Revit, it takes us a bit more, let's say, uh, task that needs to be performed because window needs to be placed on the wall. So let's start with drawing the wall first so that we can place our window over there. And uh, right now we're placing the first window. So let's select, let's select the, the window with, uh, um, uh, with one geometry. And uh, once we place this window, we will place another window next to that so that we can compare both of them. Yeah, so right now we're making the, the wall a bit bigger so we can place both windows next to each other. And let's check whether the geometry actually differs. Okay, so we're placing another window. We're zooming it up. And as you can see on the left-hand side, there is, there is this bigger window with 3000 height and on the right hand side, there is this smaller window with 2,500 height. And this, it's not only the case that, that we are able to generate the beam content, but we can also generate the cut content as you can see right now. And that was pretty much the end of the, of the, the part related with the demo. So in general, just to summarize, what is the difference between the BIM portals and the Omni channel? So when it comes to BIM portals, I think I would compare it to, to a public transport. While when, when you were working with Omni channel, I would compare it to, let's say, a private car. Everything has its pros and cons. So if you're driving a public transport, you don't need to care about using, let, about buying a car. You don't need to care about servicing the car but you have a limitation because you need to drive according to the timetable. You need to share this, the ride together with other passengers. You are not able to change the color of the train or, or bus because it doesn't belong to you. So you're not able to customize that. Of course, if you have your own car, you can drive as many miles as you like. You can drive whenever you like. You can actually change the color, change the tires and so on. So you can customize it in the way you like, in the in the way you have your preference. And this is the, the best comparison of the approach in advertising the BIM content. If you're go doing that through the BIM Omni channel, I think that the possibilities are way more flexible. When it comes to BIM portals, they are pretty much limited, but it doesn't make, it doesn't uh, says that the BIM portal approach is bad. I think that it could be the case that the BIM Omni channel strategy could also utilize the BIM portal as part of the channels of the publication, which I'm about to tell you right now. So, so in order to summarize, in order to recap our, in order to recap our, let's say, part of, of this lecture, I will tell you what are the maturity levels that we are able to differentiate when it comes to, let's say, mat maturity level from the BIM content perspective. So if if you if manufacturer starts with the beam content we call this this maturity level starter they have two options one of the option is that they can just place the beam content on the on the within the beam portals and as simple as simple as it is directly from there someone can download 
the content. The other option, I would also consider that as a starter, as some sort of an alternative, that instead of instead of promoting BIM portal site, they might be more interested in promoting their own brands and want to have the full ownership of the data by, for instance, utilizing BIM Streamer online library on one of their servers. And I would also consider that as maturity level starter, but we can move a bit on and make it a bit more sophisticated. So on the intermediate maturity level, we can, in addition to that, enter the BIM, uh, enter product information into the BIM file in an automated way, making it always up to date. This is quite substantial. In the starter case, we have the static BIM content, which needs if they which needs to be updated manually. If something is being updated manually, believe it or not, most likely it is not updated or updated very very rarely. If we have the automated product information update, the update may happen on the daily basis. Since the data are being injected automatically, we can also automatically adapt the content to particular regions. And when it comes to that, the manual update would be pretty much impossible if let's say we would like to have a different product information for for instance 30 different countries and 30 different languages i think that manually updating that would be more like a hell the other thing is the versioning and and supporting different lod and loi level of yeah details and the and information we discussed the loi on the previous uh, on the previous lecture so let's say we will skip that part but versioning is quite substantial especially if we would like to make the possibility, especially for the facility managers, to use some historical data to, to create, for instance, digital twins of, of the object. And I think the most important thing is to have the possibility to update the product information, even on a daily basis, without, let's say, having any maintenance help, uh, hell and having necessity of of hiring you know uh, an army of of content of, of of content developers so so this is an intermediate maturity level and definitely this is the solution for those of the manufacturer which has a large product portfolio on different market and they change the product information quite often and always wanted to make sure that the data are always up to date which like i said from the construction sector perspective is, is a must. The intermediate plus is something, is something a bit further. So it's not only to, to have a, a different language version, but it's also the possibility to have a different portfolio. So like I said, with the example of this HVAC manufacturer, I might have a different portfolio for Spain with solar panels, and for Scandinavia with some stoves or, or the heat pumps. So this, this is something which can, might be more, more sophisticated, but definitely more accurate. And we consider that as an intermediate. Plus, the maturity level uh, of intermediate plus can also involve utilizing external beam portals. So in order to have wider range of users, we can use our own internal websites, our own internal BIM plugins, our own internal, let's say, mobile application, but also some external parties. It could be the BIM portals, but not only. This could also be the wholesalers. The wholesalers who recently are getting notice. They are actually seeing BIM as a potential tool for increasing their sales. And for wholesalers, the BIM content is also something relevant lately. And let's say the most advanced one is when you would like to in addition to in addition to standard beam channel also involve beam content into non-standard beam channels like for instance using them within the mobile app and addressing not only the designers but also addressing other user personas like for instance investors which thanks to the mobile app can use the augmented reality or virtual re reality 
to immerse inside the, the product portfolio that the particular manufacturer offering. But not only, this could also be a tool which can be used by the installers where they can also have some installation guide, some videos with the instruction or just a quick overview of the product information within their smartphone. So the advanced level includes the publication of the content into not only BIM specific channels, but also non BIM specific channel. And I think that this is more or less summarize my part of the lecture. I will right now hand over the voice to Francois because as I mentioned at the very beginning, the PIM is the heart of the product information, but how we can make sure that this information is sufficient and how we can make sure that even if it's sufficient, they are correct, they have proper values and that they can be used across different countries, across different regions. Francois, the floor is yours. Welcome, everybody. Ethan, it's, um, it's a hot topic. Although it already exists for a long time, it's hot, it is not new, nobody really knows what it is about. So I, I hope that I can clarify a, a few things there that you yeah, might share this passion as well uh, with me that I have. Uh, Marcia was so kind to uh, put in an image of 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 um, Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Terminator Part Two, The Judgment Day. Uh, I looked it up because I did not recognize the sentence, but he comes all of a sudden with I, I I sense injuries. The data could be called pain. It's because he is a robot. He doesn't experience pain the way that people experience pain. Um, but but data data is so important. You already could notice that with BIM, um, ETIM ETIM is defining for a big part as well the I in BIM, the information or as I like to call it intelligence. Let let me first start a little bit with with a little bit of a history background. I will run through it. It is not really heavily relevant. But as already mentioned, it is new, it is not new. In 1991, they already started with it. I don't know how good your screen is, but there's a little Dutch flag on the helmet of this guy. 1991, it started in the Netherlands. And there were some Dutch uh, electric installers who actually were fed up with having all these unstructured data and so on. They couldn't really communicate with one another. It was difficult. So they came with this initiative of ETIM. ETIM at that very moment was the abbreviation for electric uh, information model. In the meantime, that changed nevertheless, uh, but that is where it all started. And then it took quite some time actually before other uh, companies were also interested in, in working with this whole ETIM approach, HVAC, and the, the plumbing sector, I believe, they started in 1998, already seven years later, still everything in the Netherlands. Uh, the uh, transport sector in 2006 uh, started having interest in the whole ETIM approach. And in 2008, so 17 years later, the Netherlands decided with a few other countries, uh, what is that, Germany, uh, Belgium, Switzerland, I believe, and, and, and France, not sure anymore. Some of my five countries, they decided to have a cooperation there. They founded ETHM International uh, with headquarters in Brussels, in Belgium. More and more um, uh, construction uh, people were interested, let's say, that is, uh, the, the shipping facilities, they also want to have their data in a structured and classified uh, way to share that information and so on. It, it did basically not stop at all. Here, even last year, they decided to not only have uh, uh, spare parts and, and radiators and whatever that you have for building a house, but also the tools which are being used to uh, make this all possible. They want to have eating classified. A little bit more background, uh, as I already told you, started in the Netherlands, 1991. 
in the meantime, 21 countries are already actively using ETHM. And I say actively, actively means that there is a local ETHM affiliate evangelizing the word in that specific country. It doesn't necessarily mean that all the companies are yet working with it or are convinced of it. But nevertheless, they are moving towards a better situation. All the blue parts there, uh, what you should see here in the world map, are countries which are already using ETIM. And I might say, what is that, 50% already, let's say, of the whole world is uh, using ETIM. 21 countries now, soon 22 countries. Hungary also decided to start working on ETIM. The blue color is getting bigger and bigger all over the world. More and more countries see the, the benefits of using ETIM, sharing data with one another in a structured and classified way. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with ETIM at all. Uh, let me explain that a little bit. Just did the history. Here is what ETIM actually does. You want to standardize your data. Let's first start with a product group. Product group will contain multiple product classes. One product class will contain multiple products. There will be some examples in a, in a minute. And the product features are only possible in four different ways. That's either alphanumeric, that means that you have a pop-up screen where you need to make a decision, A, B, C, or D is applicable to this specific product. Then you have numeric, only numbers. You have a range, so that could be um, 50 up to 1,000 Pascal uh, that it needs to support, I don't know. And logic basically means yes or no. Is it applicable? Uh, can you attach this radiator to the wall or not? It's simply a yes or no. To make it a little bit easier, some information in there. Product group could be lamps. But within lamps, there is something like a compact fluorescent lamp. Of course, I took the easiest word that to uh, that is to be pronounced in English. Nevertheless, there are more lamps, but we're only focusing on this particular lamp. It has multiple product features. For instance, a socket. Yeah, then it's alphanumeric, and it is showing uh, some kind of possibility, possibilities uh, for this uh, lamp, uh, uh, how to place or whatever. We chose here the feature socket. How much lamp power does it have? So then you have numeric, the range, mentioning the frequency, and logic. That is a little bit too small for me. Integrated twilight sensor. Is that correct, Marcia? <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, there's a really tiny screen that I'm, I'm looking at. Uh, the values that it is going to represent is here okay so the socket is then an alphanumeric uh, possibility terribly sorry about that that is an ef that means feature an eaten feature contains one or more no two or more ev ev stands for eaten value and in this case was chosen for b 15 d i am not familiar at all with lamb so i cannot tell you what it means I do know what what means. Here they want to know how much what does this uh, specific lamp contain? Well, in this case, 15. We're talking about the frequency that is hertz. So we're going from 50 up to 60. And does it have an integrated twilight sensor? And what I already said, either yes or no. In this case, it is a yes. And this is a simple way, actually, of showing how ETIM works. There are multiple product features within one product class, and those product features will have uh, every time one of those four um, uh, features, uh, which might 
create more clarity, let's say, on the side of that specific product. This is um, this is also quite interesting, actually, in my opinion, because we are in a little bit of a weird situation at this very moment. Eating seven started in twenty seventeen. That is a bit more than you know, three years ago. The idea was that starting from the 1st of September 2020, Eaton version 8 would be live. They postponed that with two months. The reason is because more and more countries are participating, so there are more people who have something to say and, and to make decisions. They needed to postpone that with two years. And three years later, Eaton 9 should then be available again. They have cycles of three years. The typical thing is at this very moment, Eaton 7, if you are now as a manufacturer working with Eaton 7, that is allowed because as soon as a new Eaton version is available, they give you one year to work on it, to make things happen because it is not work that will only involve one or two working days. You will need to have a whole army, let's say, working on that. And like in Germany, that is what I know. They're working with Ethem Static. I will come later back to that one as well. Starting from the 1st of November, Ethem 8 is available, but still till the end of October this year, you can work with Ethem 7. And then you need to start working with Ethem 8. Might not make any sense there, but the thing is that Everybody in the whole chain who is connected to this data pool, to this uh, German data pool, needs to connect in a proper way. They need to have the proper structure set up. So if you are working with Ethem 7, the data pool is working with Ethem 8, and the B2B customers in the background are working again with a completely different Ethem version, standardization is, is gone because then you cannot uh, exchange any kind of information with one another. So it is very important that as soon as you decide as a manufacturer to work on ETHM, that the whole chain is agreeing to the same approach, to the same versioning. I already mentioned ETHM 7 that and ETHM 8, those are static versions. There's an enormous difference and both have benefits and, 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 and disadvantages, actually. As soon as you're working with a static version of Eden, as I already told you, a cycle is three years, so you're good for three years. You have your arm, you have people in the background working on it, crunching the data into one in a system, making it work, sharing the data with everybody. But then three years later, you already know, okay, the new Eden version is coming, you need to cross-check everything. Uh, what are the differences between the old and the new one? Or the, what are the differences? What do we need to take into account? Maybe uh, eating classes do not exist anymore, or product features are uh, being added, uh, eating classes being merged uh, from, from five to one. Uh, then you need to have, again, a good look at the information. On the other hand, dynamic, it changes basically every second of the day. You are now working in a specific item class, and half an hour later, you get the message that does not exist anymore. You will need to find another one, or they come with a proposal. Uh, item class uh, one to three is incorrect. We moved that in item class two, four, six, whatever. Uh, but then you are always up to date, but you are constantly actually working on improving of your data. But again, if you want to do that, the whole chain of people, of, of B2B people working in this whole chain need to be connected, need to be working on the same dynamic approach. Otherwise, you have a mismatch, and then still you have nothing that they can share with anybody. There was, there is Ethem. Uh, I told you what that stands for. There's also something like Ethem MC, also again a Dutch initiative. They started a few years ago with that one. Ethem still means exactly the same. 
but the addition of MC stands for modeling class. Marcin already mentioned the BIM files. With MC, you can work with BIM and have the eating data in the previous step integrated as information in those specific BIM files. The idea is that with ETIM that you have standardized data that in an easy way, in a uniform way, that you can exchange that with between other parties. The intention, the idea is to do exactly the same with 3D product data, with BIM data. I have been working with a lot of international companies and the way that they set up the XYZ axis could be different. So you do, you never exactly know what is the starting point from what is the perspective of this specific drawer looking at this specific BIM object. Um, because for you, it, it, it might be placed in a proper way. And as soon as I start working with it, it might be upside down. That is also quite a challenge besides all the other 3 million challenges with BIM. So with ETMMC, that is a solution. Challenges, the good thing is, there are only 360 classes uh, for ETMMC. That is basically covering most, no, the mainly sold products worldwide uh, to, go, to, to go for this 80-20 rule that let's say, they assume that 80% of all the products worldwide being being created by manufacturers are able to be covered with these 360 different classes. And the other classes, they are still to come. And as I already mentioned, ETIM and BIM, the, 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 the ETIM information that is normally required uh, for example, uh, ETIM uh, transfer data and so on. That is mainly the information in what is actually required in BIM for the first stages. Uh, for other stages, it is only supporting there, but still, it is delivering a lot of good and qualitative intelligence that everybody can work with. And not only that everybody can work with it, because it is standardized, Everybody understands exactly that if it is mentioned in this specific field, what it actually represents. And the other brilliant thing is uh, working in 22 different countries, but also in around 20 different languages. You are mentioning that in Polish. I don't understand Polish at all. But as soon as I'm working with it because of my uh, interface in the background, my language uh, settings, it changes to, to Dutch uh, because I'm Dutch or it changes to English, whatever I prefer to work in. And then as soon as I make my adjustments on that side in Dutch or in English, you don't need to care about it, whether you understand my language or not, but you will understand where it is positioned and what it represents. So in my opinion, really a brilliant, way forward of, of having uh, classified and standardized data. You can maybe explain, it is, it is a bit uh, small again for me. Um, I already gave you that uh, example of the lamp. Here you can see it a little bit clearer. I will make the screen for me a bit bigger, that I know what I see. On the right upper corner, we have a picture of a convector radiator. Um, you can see here the group code uh, that was just mentioned lamps. In this case, it is radiators convectors. Here we have the codes, the EF, those are the product features. And here we have EC, that is the ethyl plan. Within this group, ETHM group, we have this ETHM class, we have these product features, and here we have the values. So we have for the material housing a specific code, which will be worldwide the same, type A, alphanumeric, and it is either steel, plastic, wood, 
or other. And if now more companies come joining with Ethem and they say, but we have it made of glass for whatever reason, it is not available now, then they can come with a proposal. They go to Ethem International, they mentioned we also want to have glass as an option. And there's then again the difference with, between dynamic and static of Ethem. Do you have dynamic? Then a few days later, glass is here available, then you can immediately choose that. As long as you're working with static, you need to wait till the next release. That is one thing. This is still the Ethem class itself. We go one step further. Let me show. I hope that you can see my mouse. Here's mentioned linked Ethem modeling classes. As soon as you are online, you click this, you go to the next site. And I click somewhere incorrect. You go to the next slide, and here you see class code MC, which stands for ETMMC modeling class. It is exactly structured in the same way. We have a group code, still the same radius convectors. The class code is slightly different. And here we have again the product features with descriptions. And we have here possible item values. But of course, completely different information than we require at the item side. The first one here is, for instance, mounting method. At this right moment, there's only one possibility. So you can only choose freestanding. And the width of the foot, that is a numeric field. And please fill in in millimeters how wide this foot is. And so on. If you now click here on open PDF in new window, that is getting more interesting, I hope, for you guys. This is a generic drawing. This is the base for ETMMC generated BIM objects. You can See here, for instance, no, that is not a good one. Here, I believe, is DN mentioned, DN1. I am not sure because, again, the screen is very small. We have all the uh, drawing codes mentioned here LE1, LE2. And in this combination, it might not really ring a bell. Based on the structure of ETMMC features, you know exactly where it should be filled in. And here you know that from uh, the Z, that is from the heart in the back of this convector radiator, that's from the middle, so from the heart to the other outside without the connections of uh, water or air, they know exactly what LE2 should be. You fill it nicely in. You do that for all these typical uh, drawing codes. And you can, oh, and you can then generate, I'm sorry, I, I thought I was expecting something else. Then you can generate based on that, a generic BIM object. So basically what it comes down to is ETM and ETM MC and BIM. You have your geometry and you have your metadata. And together that is required for a solid BIM object that planners and architects can work with. The geometry for the specific BIM object is to be delivered with ETMMC and the metadata is to be delivered with ETM. That comes again to a demo but i like to hand over to Martin. But before we do that, are there any questions? Yeah, are there any questions from the audience when it comes to when it comes to eTeam and eTeam MC before we run the demo? Okay, take take silence as a no. Maybe I will ask a question. Maybe this was not uh, clearly explained although francois mentioned that before so francois why 
within the e-team we're using the codes why we can just use the standard attributes uh, even if we can let's say normalize them somehow why can we just write with 20 why we just use for instance ef000 i don't know something and uh, and not just uh, naming it as with because there are different kinds of width you have the overall width of this uh, example, this convector radiator, but then you do not know from the heart whether it, it leans over more to the right or to the left. Uh, you have the width of the feet. Maybe you have the width of the uh, water connections or of the air connections. And if you are going to describe it only in that way, it is still not uniform exchangeable with other partners, with other countries. Then there's still no common understanding. The company that I used to work at, um, there was already a big difference between, what, what was that again? Length, depth, height, and width. Which is what? Is what is depth? What is width? What is length? I really had a lot of discussions there with, with management in the company, and they had a different understanding of width, the way that they were using it, as it is being used in ETIM. So that is where the problem then immediately starts. With uh, when you have a different perception, you are communicating in, in, in a different way than others might be able to understand you, which is, is not foolproof. Then you can make mistakes much, much easier. If you have to standardize with those codes, everybody exactly understands that because, again, it is in a different language, but also the software program can interpret that in a proper way. And the BIM object, which is going to be injected with this ETMMC data in the end, also understands what data it exactly is that you're injecting, but also where to place it and what it needs to do to this uh, BIM object. And then you get a quite good digital representation of your physical object, although in the end still it sort of looks like a shoebox. Okay. Thank you, Francois, for, for this explanation. I think that we can right now show you the demo of eTeam, I would say, in action. So before we do that, I will explain you how the demo will be orchestrated. So at the very beginning, we will try to synchronize, so inject the data in, into a BIM files for two types of BIM content. On the, at, in the first example, we will just use the typical content which can have a very, let's say, high level of details. We talk about the LOD on one of the previous lectures, so I'm sure that you know what I'm referring to. And on the second example, we will focus on the generic content, which is MC compliant. So if you remember the, the drawings that Francois was presenting with all these dimensions, so we decided to prepare the BIM content, which is pretty much prepared in the exact way as the PDF that was presented by, by Francois, which was compliant with the EMC codes. And what was done? So into the back office, we've provided the content, the custom content of a very, let's say, high level of detail radiator. And we also provided the e-team data inside, inside the Excel sheet, which later on were somehow validated with the e-team international API. So as you can see over here, it's not only the, the case that we've injected the eating data, we've also validated it and not only validated, but as Francois mentioned, due to the fact that we're working with eating codes, we were, we were managed to, to prepare automatically a translation. So we use the translation in German and in English to generate two independent BIM files directly from from the excel and from the custom content and uh, is in the result we've ended up with two bim files one was provided 
in English, the other one was provided in German. Thanks to the E-Team, we didn't have to provide this translation because we had the E-Team codes. We integrated with the API of the E-Team and we took the translation in an automated way. So with, while working with E-Team, manufacturer doesn't even have to, don't even have to provide the translation because they are already available within the team itself. And what we did later on, we combined this data together and generated the BIM file. In the latter example, we changed it a bit. So instead of using a very custom radiator with the high LOD, we came up with the simpler version of the radiator with the LOD 100, 200, something, something in between. But there is one major difference. We've managed to make this radiator fully MC compliant. Thanks to that, if manufacturer is ready to prepare the e team and e -team MC set of data, they don't even need to prepare the content because they can use the generic one. The second option is actually be, gives us the possibility to use the same radiator object, the same beam content across different manufacturers as long as they are e team and e team MC compliant. So right now I will share you the screen to present you the demo. So I will on the full screen and run the demo. As you can see here, we have this radiator, the custom radiator with high level of details. There are some default attributes as this radiator was taken over from, from an internet. And right now we're injecting, we will select this radiator to perform the synchronization against that. We've already, uh, this is quite important, so I will freeze it a bit. We've already have the E-Team data imported through the Excel sheet. I showed you how the import through the Excel sheet looks like on the previous webinar, so we skipped that part. But this is quite important, what we can achieve while we're working with classifications, like for instance, E-Team. So right now we've included that this radiator family should be validated against specific classification. So we're specifying ETIM7 because these are the data that were provided. Moreover, we also specify the attribute ID called ETIM class. So based on the attribute within the Excel sheet, which is called ETIM class, we would be able to identify which ETIM class we're referring to. And the last, last uh, settings specifies that we would like to convert the ETIM codes which are available within the Excel sheet to translation of the particular attributes. In this case, we would like to translate it to German and English. What else we can do? Because as Francois mentioned, ETIM provides us an information which attributes should be available for particular ETIM class. So let's say, simply speaking, product type. We're able to validate the quality of the data that we're about to inject inside the BIM files. In this case, we see that there are 23 warnings which are not comp fully compliant with the ETIM 7 for this particular product class. So as we can see, there is a code EF024897, which refers to degree of gloss. And we see that it has an invalid value. So the value states EV000154, which, which tra translates to other, while the ex expected values are EV000146 and EV006392, so matte and glossy. So right now, we're not only injecting the data, we're also validating whether these data are correct. And we're able to validate that because we're validating it according to some standard. Thanks to thanks to eTeam, we're actually able to perform automated quality assurance of the BIM content. Moreover, we're not only checking whether the data are valid or not, we also can validate whether we're missing some attributes. And as you can see, we have pretty lots of attributes that were not provided at all. Of course, we can proceed with the with the synchronization, we, we didn't include all the attributes just to present you the validation example. But as a, as a result, we performed the synchronization of the data and we've managed to generate the BIM file. So as you can see, here is this radiator. 
it's like I said on a high level of details, but I think that the most important part is the eTeam data. And here are the, the eTeam data, color, length, grid material, depth, and so on. These translation of the attributes were not provided within the Excel sheet. We took them from the eTeam API. The same refers to the German version. So Farbe, Lange, Hüche. So these are the namings in German, but it didn't have to be provided. They were taken from the API. And right now, we will use the, uh, the example of ETMMC. On the left-hand side, you see the very same radiator, the very same PDF that Francois was presenting in the theory theoretical part. On the right-hand side, you see some example attributes which, uh, which uh, were provided within the BIM content. These were some default values that we were used, but right now we're about to change them. So here is this Excel sheet that I that I mentioned at the beginning. So the first row refers to the first example, while the second one refers to the second example, which I will I will move it backward a bit, which refers to the ETMMC. So the so the first example, so the row number two, has only ETM codes. So the ones which are marked in yellow, usually the ETM codes for the attributes st starts with the EF, which stays from ETM features, as, as Francois mentioned. But in addition to that, the, the latter example, which is available in row number three, contains not only the ETM feature, which refers to the metadata, but also the MC code, which refers to geometry. And these codes, are the ones which you've seen on this PDF where we have each and every dimension explained in details. So right now we're using the, the generic content, which is MC compliant. We will do the same validation according to, uh, to, to E-Team 7. So they, they, were, they are using pretty much the same, the same set of data. That's why we will get the same validation warning but due to the fact that we've also already covered that let's just skip the warning and let's just navigate directly to the results of the synchronization of this content so we have the generated generic family as you can see it is not as beautiful as the original one as the previous one but there is one very important difference first of all we can steer the data we can steer the geometry thanks to the eTeam code. You see that there is an eTeam data, but we also have the eTeamMC data. And this eTeamMC reflects the actual geometry. Thanks to that approach, multiple manufacturers can actually use the same content as long as they provide the eTeamMC data, which refers to geometry. Right now, I also changed the, the language so that you can see that the attributes are also available in in German. So uh, so let's just download this content and let's open it within Revit so we can see that we actually change the geometry. So let's navigate to to the original content which was prepared and this content we're about to synchronize and right now let's just download the exact content which was synchronized and where we injected the data also including the mc geometry data and we can compare them both so on the left hand side you see the original let's say template object the generic content before the synchronization on the right hand side you can see that the the content differs so there is a bv value which on the left side is over one 1400 on the right hand side uh, sorry 140 on the right hand side it has 100 there is also the the d value which which pretty much differs so so if we would also compare the geometry of of the the generic content and the content which was generated out of this generic template by providing the mc data of specific manufacturer you would actually see the difference uh, with your own eyes but in addition to that We've also injected the eTeam class and other eTeam attributes which are not available in the input file. So long story short, 
the the thing is that thanks to eTeam, first of all, you have a structuralized set of attributes. You're able to validate whether the data within the attributes are, let's say, in standard to some particular set of features. In this case, whether they contain all the features required by eTeam, which allows you to also specify the quality of the content. And thanks to eTeamMC, we can also standardize, standardize the BIM libraries so that they can be used across different manufacturers. And I think that is the main, let's say, advantage of, of using eTeam and eTeamMC in particular. So I think that I will right now hand it over back to Francois so that he can answer the question whether the eTeam is actually a BIM game changer. Francois, I'm handing you over the voice. Yeah, thank you. Uh, by the way, I can't say too long anymore because then I have another uh, meeting uh, coming up. Uh, but nevertheless, as you already said, what the biggest benefit is of of ETMC, well, was that to standardize the data, right? To standardize the, the BIM objects. That is true, but not the only truth. What actually the coolest thing is, in my opinion, because I know that firsthand, and that is why I think ETMMC will be a game changer. Now as a manufacturer, as soon as you want to have some kind of BIM object for your, um, for your uh, physical product, you need to get a quotation from the uh, technical drawing party and so on, costing money, costing time. Do they have time available for you? Might take up to one or two months before they then finally come with results. You're not happy with it, and so on. So it might take two, three months before you finally have your BIM object. And they are of the highest quality. There, because I believe that wasn't mentioned before. Uh, the bigger, the higher the quality is, the more of these BIM objects that you, as a planner, are using in your um, BIM drawings. Computers are fast nowadays, but uh, they need to have a lot of power in the background to calculate and recalculate the whole time. And you can see the files are much, much smaller. So if you are working, for instance, on a hospital and you want to place their radiators, you do not only need one. You need one per room. How many rooms are there in, in a hospital? 100? 500? The file is from our side, uh, what, 20, 30 kilobytes, and then you need 500. Or the file size is high quality, really beautiful, one and a half, two megabytes, and then you need 500 of them. And you do not only need radiators, you need all the tubes, the electricity connections, the power sockets, the ventilators, uh, alarm, uh, CO2 uh, sensors, whatever that you can think of. So these files are enormous. E2MC is there definitely helping. Not only that, the well, we're still sort of in the first phase of this whole BIM approach. The quality should not be of the best quality because again, the computers are not as strong and so on. But it is it is for planning purposes. As soon as the the the, the what is it dimension six or seven is going to start, and we didn't discuss dimensions at all, but uh, I believe dimension seven is uh, supporting facility management, of course. Then it is brilliant when they are in very high quality. That might be in 10, 20 years. Computers will be much much stronger solutions will be much, much different, then they can work with it. But for now, for the first years, when everybody's working on BIM, why not? And that is not only the, the only good thing. The other good thing is because normally in the in a traditional way, you need to go to ask a quotation, you need to wait and so on. But also, as soon as you have a product, you have to digitalize, it is very normal that in a few months it will change again. 
you want to have a different material, you want to have it a little bit longer, whatever, different button, you need to ask again for a quotation. Again, this whole uh, process that you need to go through. And now you have a solid PIM solution. You are working with ETMMC. You simply go into the system and you say instead of 100 millimeters, it will be 110 millimeters. And it is immediately live. And then with the BIM stream data cockpit, you have this historical data in the background covering that, knowing, okay, today is 20th of May. I changed the, uh, the width from 100 to 110. But yesterday it was still 100. So if there are planners already working with your product with the 100 version, you can send out a message and a notification. Um, something changed there and we cannot deliver the product anymore. With ETMMC set up in a good way, you are really master of your own data. You are fully in control and you're not depending on anybody. So getting back to the question, is ETMMC a BIM game, BIM game changer? From my perspective, definitely, because I've seen it. And I hope that with my short story, with my short lecture, that I have been able to convince you as well of this opportunity that is going to change the whole digital world in, in construction drawings and so on. Martin, I'm getting it back to you. Give me one second. I want to thank all of you. I'm terribly sorry, but I really now need to leave because I'm already late. So, but again, no thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? I believe some uh, contact details are being shared after uh, afterwards. So. Have a great day and um, hope to hear anything from you guys. Bye-bye. Martin, bye, bye, bye. Thank you very much, Francois. When it comes to ETMAC, I, I think that in general, we will still, I hope that uh, you as a student will still have a chance to, to work on that because uh, let's hopefully, starting from the next semester, we will have the occasion to actually work with Beam Streamer and uh, beam streamer platform to prepare the beam content and i believe that on some examples we will definitely would like to prepare some content which is mc compliant and getting back to to our let's say summer of the lecture if there is someone else uh, apart from the poznan university of technology and if you, you are interested in let's say convincing your university to also take part in the BIM Streamer lecture and to join the collaboration of using the BIM Streamer within your own university. Definitely give us a shout. We've already onboarded Silesian University of Technology and Politechnica Poznańska, so Poznan University of Technology, to join the common educational project of preparing the BIM content. And we're also waiting for your university to join our initiative as well. So last but not least, if someone has any questions related to ETIM, related to PIM, related to Omnichannel, this is the last moment to, to actually ask, ask them. If not, I think that we're about to close this lecture. So I'm waiting so, for something like 10 seconds. If there are some questions, then, then I would be happy to answer. If not, I think that, that we can finish it by now. So I see that someone is typing. Thank you so much. Okay, so, so I think that I, I'm happy that, that this lecture was pretty much interesting. In case you still will have some questions, you can take take a screenshot of, of the slide so you will see my where you can see my email address. If you have some questions also to Francois, you can also send it over to me and I will send it over to him so that he can reply. So thank you very much for the participation. I hope you enjoyed the session and I hope that we will be able to have the occasion to see on the next episode of, of the lecture of BIM for te technology BIM. Thank you very much. Bye.